Accessibility for New Zealanders Bill. Uh, so this we've been hearing for a number of weeks um, on this matter. So no my hari mai, welcome to the Social Services and Community Select Committee, our committee Fidifiri Taki Ratonga Papore Taki Hapore. Um, and we have um, we have a couple of hours of hearings to go, and then that will con conclude our public part of the process. So with that, um, just checking that we have our uh, interpreters present today. If I could just check with the clerks. Kia ora, Madam Chair. We only have interpretation for the one submitter that requires NZSL, and that's later in the agenda. Okay, thank you so much for that, Izzy. Appreciate it. No okay, uh, with that, we will uh, commence with um, the Fetal Anticonvulsant Syndrome New Zealand with De uh, Dennis Astell. Tēnā Dennis, if you would like to turn... Oh, Denise, sorry. <laughs> if you'd like to turn on your uh, camera. Oh, yes, there you are. And, um, and you're off mic. Right. Hey, thank you for coming um, and chatting with us today and talking about um, your submission. Please take it as being read. Um, we're, we're here with you for 15 minutes. Um, do you require a, a descriptor of those of us in the room? No, I don't. Great. Okay. Sorry, Denise. Oh, getting your name wrong. Dennis, Denise, always do that. That's right. I'm um, used to it. <laughs> I'm sure you are. It's it's one of those funny um, things that catch in my brain, I think. So anyway, um, uh, nā mihi nui, kia, ko, uh, kia koe, welcome. And uh, we are in your hands for 15 minutes. If you'd like to leave some time for questions, please do so. But this is your opportunity to talk with us. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Tēnā koutou. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today as the representative of Fetal Anticonvulsant Syndrome New Zealand, FACS-NZ. It's always a mouthful, so I'm shortening it down to FACS-NZ for the Accessibility Bill. My name is Denise Astell, and I am the Executive Officer of FACS-NZ. FACS-NZ does support an Accessibility Bill, but just not at as currently stands. Whilst representing FACS-NZ, I also have my own experience with disability and accessibility issues and have two adult disabled daughters. I'm an expert by experience. I know the day-to-day -day struggles as you fight to remove barriers, especially within a system that loves tick boxing, but not complexity. Although the bill allows for a formation of a committee which ticks the right boxes, there seems to be little authority to actually force change. Whilst attending the fifth global ministerial summit on patient safety in Switzerland, the Director General of the World Health Organization stated, if it is not safe, it is not care. Whilst this is health related, it can certainly be reflected within the disability community as there is a lot of disabled people that have had trauma or harm in their lives. And unfortunately, the bill as it stands now could possibly cause more harm to people. Using the health model, albeit whilst it is a flawed system, and comparing it against the accessibility bill, you can see how glaringly obvious that this bill is not fit for purpose. Using the areas addressed in our written submission, here is a very non-detailed comparison to what is currently in the health system and what is proposed in the bill. Accessibility standards. For health, there is the Health and Disability Code of Consumer Rights. Noting that there is not accessibility standards in this code. Accessibility Bill has no standards. Regulator. Health has a regulator which is currently MedSafe and in the process of being reviewed and updated through the Therapeutic Products Bill. 
Accessibility Bill has no regulator. Barrier Notification System. Health has places that you can report adverse events to medicines and devices. Accessibility Bill has no notification system. Disputes Resolution Process. In health, currently, you can have this under the individual health entities or take it to the Health and Disability Commission and hopefully, in the near future, the option will be available for a restorative process. No central dispute resolution system is available through the health system, though. The Accessibility Bill has no disputes resolution system. FaxNZ acknowledge that whilst this bill comes from the best of intentions, Unfortunately, as it stands, it is not fit for purpose, yet an accessibility bill is desperately needed. You as a select committee have the opportunity to make the positive changes that we all desperately need, whether that be the, a total overhaul of this bill or starting totally fresh from a new bill, with a new bill. We need to remember accessibility benefits everyone. Thank you once again for your time. Thanks, Denise. Really good submission. Great comparison as well. I appreciate that. I have a question now from uh, Teresa Ngobi and then from one from Maureen Pugh. Oh, Morena Denise, and thank you for your submission. It was really good. I also really liked the um, comparison to the health, so like in terms of your uh, code of consumer rights um, and also the central resolution, uh, disputes resolution. So, um, I, and I'm also hearing just at the end, you talk about two things, either a complete overhaul or um, starting again. My, my question to you would be, uh, if it was to start again, I mean, obviously you'd want some of those things in it, the consumer rights and whatnot, um, but in terms of the time that that might take, uh, mm -hmm. so that could push it down the line a bit, what does that mean? Like, do you, is that an issue for you or is it about trying to make um, like the overhaul and, and putting those things in now and and whether everything goes in there and what that looks like for you? I hope that makes sense. It totally makes sense and it's a great question. I think the bill as it stands now, we've actually got nothing to lose to actually have a whole new bill started. I would actually prefer, and this is fact NZ would prefer, that it is correct right from the start rather than an overhaul might actually take a lot longer then starting afresh would look like. Um, I think it needs to be that there's a promise, though, that there is going to be an accessibility bill and that it is in with co-design of all the parties that are mentioned within the, the bill, um, previous, you know, this current bill, mm -hmm. because the thing is that without that co-design, you won't need, or you won't know what the disabled community actually need, because we've got to remember there's not just physical um, disabilities, there's also invisible disabilities that need to be addressed as well. Thanks, Denise. Thank you. Maureen, sorry, off mute now. Yep. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks for your submission, Denise. I think you've probably already asked my, answered my question um, because I was going to ask you, um, in terms of the bill that we've got in front of us, what bits of it do you think are salvageable and you know, how can we make it better with what we've got in front of us? That's a really good question. And I, you know, is it salvageable? Um, I think with a real massive overhaul, it could be, but you've got to be put, listening to all the submissions to what needs to go in there. Um, that's why you have to question whether actually starting afresh would be the better option. Mm. Okay, thank you. And we have a final question from Anahila Kanoataha Suisuiki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, kia ora, Denise. Yeah. Um, my, my question is about that. Is it the conference you attended in Switzerland? So what lessons did you bring back? Uh, did you find it was something that we could use here in New Zealand? 
Yes, so it was about um, patient safety. And I mean, I'm actually going to be doing a whole report about it, a whole document about it, which I'm more than happy to share with actually the whole committee. Um, and I mean, I think, you know, the, the statement that was said, if it's not safe, it is not care. That there sums everything up. And mm -hmm. if you have that in mind and you resonate that throughout your everything that you do, it's actually a pivotal moment because that can change your um, thought. But actually, other things that I got from um, being at the um, at the summit was there because there were whole lots of different countries and everything. It is very much about putting that consumer at the heart of everything and because it was more about the um the pa global patient safety um uh, program that's in place that's what it was mainly talking about but that's so that's health related but it's actually can be pivoted into disability absolutely thank you Sorry, I disappeared on the screen. Um, so Denise, it appears that we've come to the end of our questions. Um, how, how far off would that report be? Uh, that report will probably be about a month away. Right, okay. No, I, the, the reason I ask is um, perhaps it's um, some additional reading, but something that wouldn't be a part of our deliberations here, no. but we'd be really interested, I think, as, as a committee to receive that. And so the best way to do that is to send that to our um, to our, our clerks and we can uh, have it um, sent out to us all. So thank you for that. And thank you for your submission. Um, really uh, sound good examples, um, really useful. Um, oh, and I also have a request for your notes um, from Maureen that you were perhaps reading from today, yes. if we could have um, a copy of those sent in to the clerk now, yes. uh, and that way we can put them into the record. A so, absolutely, yes, I have to read off notes, otherwise I can't remember it all. <laughs> yeah, I I know your pain. <laughs> thank you, um, thank you so much for um, presenting to us today. Um, have a good rest of your day. Thank yes, you. you too. Thank you so much. Kakite. Now we have um, Xavier Walsh, um, the Unite Union and Aotearoa McDonald's Workers Council um, for us today as well. So if we could have Xavier, hello Xavier, tēnā koe, um, come on into the room. If, yes, there you are. Um, thank you. Really appreciate you, your time today, Xavier. Are you being joined with anyone else? Uh, kia ora. No, no, it's just me today. Um, Wonderful. Yes, so unfortunately, the person that I was working on this bill submission with has um, resigned from their job um, at oh. McDonald's, as is the nature of fast food, because they're the high yeah. in the industry, yeah. and unfortunately isn't, wasn't well uh, suited for their disability. <laughs> oh, that's, but, that's unfortunate to hear, but we, we have yeah. you, Xavier, and we have you for 15 minutes. You can take the time as you want, um, and... Um, and, and present to us, uh, uh, but if you would like to leave some time for questions, we'll probably have some for you, um, which will be great. And, um, but ultimately you have 15 minutes with us to tell us what we need to hear. So we're in your hands. Nā mihi nui kia koe, welcome. So, uh, tēnā koe. Uh, so kia ora koutou katoa. My name is Xavier Walsh. I'm co-president of Unite Union um, and here representing uh, Unite and the McDonald's Workers Council, I believe. Um, it's been a while since I wrote this bill submission because the turnaround's been quite long. Um, yes. And so when I went to go and look at other people's written submissions this morning, because um, I've been a bit busy, unfortunately the website didn't work, so I didn't actually get to read. I did read um, set, like the Human Rights Commission one a few weeks ago, which was quite good. I'd like to talk about their submission. Um, however, I couldn't actually find these specific points because the website wasn't quite working <laughs> in terms of being able to get the PDF. But um, I suppose the points that Unite wanted to make were that, you know, we sort of stand with, um, 
with the community and, and demanding more for this bill. Um, we've heard it, um, we heard it in the last submission, for example, I'm sure you've been hearing it for the entire submission process, that this bill just in its current form isn't fit for purpose. Um, and that it fails to meet the needs that people actually want to see. Well, there are some good points, um, you know, that the, the, the intention of the bill is there. I think that it's really important that we recognize that we do actually need to ensure that um, people with disabilities in our communities, our lives need to feel as though they can engage fully and actively um, in society without any barriers whatsoever. That's a really important point. Um, yeah, so I suppose in our in submission, um, I worked with, uh, um, you know, our, our uh, our internal disabled um, workers, uh, workers network um, and also Kaimahi Kaha of the CTU Nunanga in order to sort of gauge with what workers were thinking about this focus coherently um, that is who we focus on but as well as um, beyond that as well because the, the issue of disability affects people in a way that um, they can't necessarily work and so it's important that we recognize that um, we need to ensure that that uh, the this bill does uh, allow people to um, lower barriers but also beyond that um, but beyond that I suppose um, that if people can't work for whatever reason that that they need to feel supported did you have a question Lou I'm just putting my hand up for the end so I won't jump in you keep going okay. and, um, yeah I'll leave it to the chair that that's that's good Okay, just thought I'd ask. Um, I'm happy to answer questions along the way, that's fine. Um, yes, so um, <clears throat> I suppose, uh, generally speaking, um, the issue of disability is quite pervasive in our society and um, it limits access to um, so much for so many different people in so many different ways. Um, we came up with a few sort of solutions as, as um, and sort of agreeing again, continuing some of those, um, some of that corridor with with those um, and for, at Faikahi, uh, Faikaha Kaimahi, um, no Kaimahi Faikaha, and um, the CTU group, um, uh, the CTU sector group. Um, and again, I'd like to talk about what they were saying in terms of they would like a regulator in this space because I think it's really important to actually like create some meaningful change as well as um, they talked about the Minimum Wage Exemption Act, which I think we can all agree is something that's actually quite egregious. The fact that those who um, are disabled and unable to work at can be paid less than minimum wage, because we know that the minimum wage in fact, um, isn't, isn't even enough in its current state to sort of live off of. So how can we expect others to sort of live off less than the minimum wage? It's entirely wrong. And it's an indictment in our society. Um, that we can allow people who do earn less than the minimum wage um, to do so. You know, I'm a big fan of the living wage. I think that no one should earn less than that. I sit on the, the governance board for the living wage movement. And I believe it's really vital that we ensure that all people, regardless of who they are and their ability within our society, that if they are workers and they are working for a wage, they should at least be getting the living wage of the minimum wage pay. Um, we can't allow this to continue any further. Um, Yes. Um, yeah. Sorry, I have been quite busy. So um, it is sort of, I did make some points within the submission itself, but I suppose I am sort of ready for questions because um, it's been a bit of a hectic few weeks. Hi, thanks, Xavier. Um, I think um, one of the things about the, the this process is that yeah people have put their submissions in quite some time ago and um and refreshing and going back to them is always a, a bit of a shock but i think your points have been well made anyway um and i think as well that i mean the reality is that uh, Unite union um is saying very similar things to um our other unions as well um in regards to this piece of legislation so we'll 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 move now to liz for the question thanks Oh, thanks, Xavier, and um, thanks for some really excellent comments in the submissions. Um, one of the things you put in your written submission was talking about the committee needing to be a larger size and then saying it should have clear feeders. And I think you were talking there about um, ensuring that you get representation of people from the community on the committee. Can you just talk a little bit more about what 
um, you would like to see in terms of describing the types of skills and experience that you'd like to see on that committee? And if you've got any thoughts on how um, those people might be becoming you know, be a big representative of those actually out in the community. Right, I suppose this is a question for the community at large. And I suppose the, the issue with disability is that it's so, um, it's so wide in terms of what uh, it can cover because there's, it, it's an entire spectrum. Um, and, you know, it's, um, I suppose it's really important that if the committee is larger, you can actually cover more, more sectors. Like, and so lots of people have very different experiences to disability, you know, um, like a wheelchair user and in different communities as well. Um, so like our Pacific and, and Maori um, um, disabled peoples may not have experienced the same, um, ex may not have the same experiences to disability in their communities and in society than others. And so mm -hmm. it's really important that we recognize that people have different experiences and that, you know, I think the important bit is, is that this committee needs to be well-funded and that people need to feel as though um, there are less barriers to that. So I, I know that um, there was some talk about um, in the bill, going back, um, about ensuring that people um, are funded appropriately so that they can get to these meetings, but it's it's more than that. They need to feel as though they can have ownership in the space because a lot of people will still have to go uh, a lot out of their way, even though they have um, really good experiences and, and knowledge that will be able to guide this process. So I think it's important that we continue to reduce barriers wherever possible and also get a plethora of views. Not so much that it becomes a C and it's impossible to do anything, but more so that you that you can ensure that there are lots of different viewpoints. Cool. And then just further to that, um, in terms of barriers within the workplace, how would you see um, the sort of people with experience with addressing those barriers included in the committee? Would it be more just people having lived experience or are you thinking of anything else to make sure that expertise is around the table? Yes, yeah, certainly lived experience is vital, but also um, if we're talking about workers, they need to feel as though they can take time off from their jobs um, to participate because this is, it, it is it's in, in essence another job to participate on a committee. Um, and so like they can't create a barrier in their own workplace and then expect them to sort of navigate that barrier and the other barrier. So you do need a, a plethora of views. And so I think, um, again, that's another issue for um, like the committee process itself to sort of engage with. But, you know, we need to understand that the committee needs to be quite holistic in its approach and understandings of this issue as a whole. Right. Thanks. That's useful. So, Savia, I just have a question on, on that. Um, on the, I guess on the payment and the size of the committee. Um, so um, from what I understand, most people, um, people who are participating on this committee will get reimbursed. Um, and, and obviously that's a, that's a system that's set up in um, how things are done in government really. Um, and we've had a lot of feedback that talks about that being a horrendous barrier for people. Um, having to fund themselves um, or seek the funding um, and getting it paid afterwards. Um, it, what I, I think I know what your views are around this, but um, it just really um, be useful for you to kind of articulate for us what kind of barrier that creates um, in terms of participation. Be really useful, I think. Well we, we know what the sort of experiences in terms of, you know, people with disabilities are experiencing um, higher rates of, you know, uh, unemployment um, and as well as sort of underemployment. So like we know that there's also like financial barriers already off the bat um, for a majority of people who will ha have something really good to give. No, I can give an example. Um, it's different, but, you know, um, a, a couple of weeks ago, um, one, there was an admin era within our union where one of um, where someone's hotel they were going to a different city um, they were a member and so um, they had to pay two hundred fifty dollars out of pocket that would that got reimbursed the next day I think we managed to rectify that but the fact that they had to try and come up with that money as a low paid hospitality worker was almost impossible like these people are already living paycheck to paycheck and then this this particular individual wasn't disabled but it was but it was you know it was really hard for them 
in that moment to try and scrounge together the money. So what can we do when we already know that there are so many barriers to go from a reimbursement system? We need to make sure that we take active measures to make sure people will not only get reimbursed, but also get paid ahead of time. Like, yes, there is expectation they show up, but like that they also can show up. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that uh, happens in some organisations is you have the P, a P card or a, a purchase card, which is sort of like a credit card, but it actually means that you can, um, you know, pay for the things up front, like your meals and things like that. And there are all sorts of rules around that. You know, you can't buy alcohol and, um, you know, you have a certain amount that you can spend to, but there's um, there are certainly systems and ways that we can we can make things more um, affordable for people to participate in um, in this. It, look, do I have any other questions from the rest of the uh, team? Oh, there's one from Ricardo. So we'll go to Ricardo, Xavier. Oh, good, I say, Vera. I guess um, you mentioned briefly that you sought feedback from disabled members within your union, and um, I, I'd be keen for you to expand, I guess. I know you couldn't bring your co-presenter, but I guess if you wouldn't mind expanding on some of that direct feedback that you were given and just sort of like what are what are some of the broader views that were expressed from from those members? Right. I suppose um so that was a while ago um since this a submission process, but I suppose it's sort of the same things that we've been hearing throughout this whole um this whole submission process in terms of workers just not having access to the things they need. Um <clears throat> I yeah, no, so um, we did engage with a lot of people, um, but unfortunately disability is so is so um, diverse, it's especially um, you know, you're combating with mental health, physical disability, um, and so on and so forth, that, you know, many found that there were so many different barriers and that each one made it really hard. Um, some people felt that they didn't have enough sick leave for whatever reason, especially particularly though, uh, you know, with like chronic Ill, uh, chronic pain or chronic illness, and also those with quite debilitating mental health um, um, mental health um, issues, and so you know many found that you know there also wasn't enough sick leave that that um, that the the environments they're working in as well are, are designed um, for a particular type of of worker that is one that is able bodied and able to show up every day and work high pace high speed on 100%, well, 120% when needed, you know, during your middle of a rush all of the time. And that is quite fatiguing and that's quite, it's quite a high bar to entry, especially when we know that this is a low paid industry where they expect 120% um, all the time for, for, for nothing, for peanuts. That, and that's the, that's the reality of the situation that we've got and that we're facing. Um, and so even though many want to work, it just becomes more and more of a barrier um, I suppose, I hope that answers some of your question because it was a minute ago. Great. Looks like it it, it did. Xavier, hey, thanks um, so much for uh, your submission today. I really appreciate you coming and talking with us. Um, we're we're out, out of questions, but um, uh, consider your submission as read. And um, I've really appreciated you making the time today um, on behalf of your union and the McDonald's workers to come and talk with us. We appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day. Namahi nui kia kui. Thank you. Thanks. Kakiti. So we now have Liam Carter. We could let Liam into the room. That would be great. Into the Zoom room. Tanakwe Liam, I see that you are uh, joining us and Hi. your camera's on. Hi. Um, hey, thanks so much for joining us. We've got 10 minutes with you. This is completely your time, Liam. Um, happy to hear from you and um, consider that we've read your submission. Um, and uh, so whatever you want to say to us in regards to the sledge, we're in your hands. You, Welcome. You just remind me what I've written. That was a while back. So your submission was about the accessibility bill 
and I haven't got it in front of me exactly. I read it yesterday. Liz, did you? Um, yeah, so there's, um, I think you were focusing a lot on the benefits of cycling and thinking about how you could ensure accessibility um, for cyclists in terms of, I think you've talked about um, narrow bike lanes, um, cyclists yeah, dismounting, right, yeah, that, yeah. those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. So my name is Liam. I run a group called Ride Your Track, um, and we focus on the accessibility in New Zealand, making sure the footpaths are kept clear and the bike lanes are kept clear. Um, we do a lot of advocating. I live in Hamilton, so I advocate for Hamilton Council, um, central government and other councils that I need to do a project with um, if need be. Um, at the moment, I'm advocating about cars on the footpath and cycle lane as this is a major accessibility issue, um, leaving kids and mobility users on the risk of um, leaving the path, going out onto the road um, and risking their life, especially the youth and the elderly who can't really see unless they go out onto that road into that live lane of traffic. Now, this becomes an accessibility issue. Um, of course, when you're stepping yourself or your family member um, out into traffic and then you're navigating your way around that vehicle. Um, the other issues I have is people parking in bike lanes, obviously leaving the cyclist or my relative user to swing into traffic. Um, and then... A big one is um, crossings and curbs, leaving that wheelchair to go, hold on, this footpath isn't wide enough, or this footpath is on a lane, or hold on, there's a car on the footpath, or um, another one is the crossing is to, um, the curve for the crossing is to, um, on a lane that I, I may tip over and it's a risk for everyone. You leave your house to go to work or school or just go out and socialise and there's always barriers in the way and that's what really annoys me. So I've started a group where we um, advocate about accessibility and we do things like this and we... Um, talk to people like government and council um, about how can we change this because when, when you're building a bike lane or a footpath or a shed path, you're not thinking about mobility users. They're not thinking about deaf people, blind people. They're not thinking about the elderly and the youth. They're thinking you're able to use it. That's all we care about is the safety of you not near a car. That's it. So I want to change that. And that when we come in now, there's a lot more accessibility, but it's not good enough to. We see it every day, kids getting hit by cars, cyclists getting hit. Um, People falling onto the road because of the curbs. Um, and it just, it really annoys me because, yes, I have cerebral palsy and I can, I can walk. I'm not in a wheelchair. I have a trike um, and I can go on the road easy. But many of us can't. They either risk their life or go home. And it's, it's like, is this what we want New Zealand to look like? Do we want cars on the footpath? Do we want 
um, people were choosing, you know, go to work or stay home because there's one part of the footpath that isn't accessible for them. So I had a long time to think, how can we fix this issue and what is really in it? And number one is, Obviously, I've done a lot of submissions for councils and government. And obviously, having that, would you like to hear more, is very important. And just uh, communicating with those people on how can we do more? Uh, how can we involve this person? Maybe it's taking them down before you open them and letting them walk through and tell you what the barriers are still. And I've seen a lot of projects, usually in the Auckland, uh, Northland region at the moment, that they're changing car parks, but they take, they're putting yellow lines in. But actually my thought is, now they go park more on the footpath. So there's not really any point unless you're upgrading the safety of pedestrians and cyclists and mobility users. What's the point of actually fixing something for cars unless it's going to um, upgrade all users of the road and footpath? And then two more issues I want to talk about today is transport. Now, obviously, buses and all that are a big part of accessibility. And we're trying to upgrade our bus system and our train system to become more accessibility. But look, I see it a lot in Hilton. Our bus drivers don't care. And it's not just about accessibility and getting your wheelchair on and off a bus. It's actually, is the bus driver going to help you? Is he going to look after you? Is he going to care for you? Or is he just going to think you're another guy on that bus? Because there was a big discussion on Facebook the other week with a guy in Hamilton who didn't think changing lanes and looking behind him was a law. So he would go up to cyclists and say, if I need to change the lane, you need to look out for me. I don't need to look out for you. And if I and if you're there, I will run you over. Is that really what we want to hear from a New Zealand bus driver? Is that who we are? Are we cars don't follow the law, so why should I, a bus driver, be following the law? They and they are one of New Zealand's number one transport options, apart from walking, train and cycling. Um and then another thing that we need to take into consideration is not saying uh, biking is an option. We need to say cycling is an option because we have Bike Wellington, Bike Auckland, Bike Waikato, Bike Northland. They should be cycling Auckland, cycling Wellington, the cycling community and a government. They shouldn't be bike because bike is too many. You're not with trikes. You're not with other adaptive cycle wear. Even though they do do that, but that really concerns me is we know accessibility is more and more important, but at least we we take into consideration more and more because it... Yeah, that's a longer pay because I'm just, I'm happy all the projects are coming out, but mobility needs to be 
taken in as number one. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Liam. We've actually just about come to time. Um, I see there's one quick question from Maureen, but um, I actually want to thank you for your submission and the, the comment around, um, you know, bike associations, and, and that's actually exclusionary. So that's really useful to hear. Um, but I'll, a quick question from Maureen, and then we'll move on. But thanks for your submission. Appreciate no it. Mm. Yes, um, thanks, Liam, and thanks very much for the advocacy and the lobbying that you are obviously doing in your own time. Um, that makes you a real champion. Uh, look, I, I, just in terms of the legislation that we are dealing with today, um, so I'm clear about the, the um, information that you've shared with us. Is that the type of thing that you would like to see in the legislation? Yeah, yeah, of course. I want to see everything to do with accessibility and narrow bike lanes and the barriers. Um, and maybe if we could, if I could um, stay on your email list and you could just continue to email me with a project I'd like to have a say, if that's okay. Sounds great. Thank you. I just needed to be clear that you that they were the suggestions you had for the bill. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Liam. Really appreciate you um, coming and talking with us today, telling us uh, your views. You've articulated them really clearly um, and really advocated for the community um, that you represent. I have to say, um, it's helped me think a little bit more about our cycleways, but also, you know, our footpaths, absolutely. I know um, getting around our footpaths um, is a huge issue for many people, but um, adding the additional cycleway issue and um, mobility vehicles or, um, is, is a huge issue addition into that and I really really like the suggestion of before these things are open that um, representatives from the community get an opportunity to go through and I guess audit and say hey this isn't going to work for us and this is why so I appreciate that it's really useful and sound suggestion thanks Liam hopefully we'll hear from you at another time on another submission have a good rest of your day thanks heaps yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye. Now, we are now coming to uh, Barry Kirkland. Um, if uh, Barry, you can come into the room. We have our uh, sign language interpreter here with us. Now, I understand, Barry, that um, the interpreter will be supporting are you through the submission? Um, are you there, Barry? Ah, there you are. Now, um, would you like a descriptor of uh, those of us who are in the Zoom room, Barry? Hi, Hi Barry. Um, <clears throat> Uh, can you see me okay? Yes. I'm just going to double, the interpreter is just going to double check that um, I'm clear. So can you see me? Can you see me clear? Cool. Yes. Thank you. All organised then. Okay. So um, um, so things like this have failed before. Um, so that's why I've got um, this at the moment. Um, so I'm happy that it's all working now. It, um Okay. So we are in your hands, uh, Barry. Would you like a description of who's in the Zoom room for you? Yes, please. Great. Okay. So I'm Angie Warren Clark. I'm the chair. I'm based in the Bay of Plenty. And I am a blonde woman with glasses. And today I am wearing checks. Brown and black checks. Um, we'll go to uh, Maureen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, Barry. 
my name is Maureen Pugh. I've got short, um, dark brown hair and I'm wearing glasses. And today I have on a, a striped jacket over a black T-shirt. And Ricardo. Uh, kia ora, Barry. My name is Ricardo. I'm a Green MP. I'm based in Tamaki Makoto. Um, and I'm here in my study um, and I'm wearing a, a, a green sweater. Liz. Akira, I'm Liz Craig. I'm a Labour List MP based down in Invercargill. Um, I've got blonde hair. And Anahila. Uh, kia ora, Barry. Anahila. I'm a Labour List MP based in Papakura. And I'm wearing pink today, glasses and black hair. And Abraham. Uh, kia ora, Barry. My name is Abraham. I'm a List MP based in Wellington. Um, I'm wearing today um, a blue and a yellowish shirt. Good to have you here. And finally, Teresa. Oh, kia ora, Barry. Um, my name is Teresa. I'm the Labour um, uh, MP for the Otaki Electorate. Uh, I have brown skin, brown hair, and I've got a black top on today. Right. Um, so back to me, Barry, um, Angie. So just we're absolutely um, available now to hear um, from you in regards to your submission. I understand our interpreter is going to uh, interpret into English or uh, language for us so that um, we can communicate uh, appropriately. So we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you um, for telling me your names and everything. It's good to be able to match the faces. Um, so is every, can you guys see me okay? You're, You're coming. Good? Yeah, absolutely, Barry. It's wonderful. We've got the technology working. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yay. <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay. Okay. Um, so now... Um, my submission is um, with my perspective. Um, I don't actually think that um, the current, oh, yep, I currently rate the bill of, um, as it says here, two out of 10. Um, I'm not overly fond of it. Um, and we need to um, improve the bill, obviously, from a nine out of 10 to a nine or a 10 out of 10. Um, because then um, access is more, accessibility becomes more access granted rather than just, um, you know, trying it out kind of thing. The only thing that's going to cut the mustard is access, um, fully access, full access granted, sorry. It's going to require a lot of hard work because there are a lot of barriers that we have. Um, we get often access is denied to us. Um, and really what we want is our, um, to have fully um, have full um, access granted. And that's what we kind of want now and for the future. Um, to make the system successful, um, it's going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of It's going to just take a lot of hard work to make things um, as we need them to be to improve it so that we fully achieve um, access for everyone. Um, this is the goal. So um, I'm, my submission is kind of on behalf of deaf people um, and talking about employment for deaf people. Um, so the current system for um, employing deaf people um, for workers is actually not deaf friendly and it can be extremely unsuccessful. Um, and um, so we need to open the door so that deaf can have um, good careers and have great career roles in the future. At the moment, there are a lot of barriers, a lot of closed doors, um, 
and deaf people have so many barriers you know if they find a job um they often put minimum wage um if and okay sorry i can't see that <laughs> i'm gonna have to lean forward um okay so um to unlock the system um, you know, this is kind of the key of what we need to do to make things better. Um, we need to um, educate um, employers. We need to um, improve hiring processes. We need to match the right jobs with the right people. And deaf workers um, need to be upskilled. And um, they do have skills that are in demand. So this is a key. I think it's the key to unlocking all the barriers for um, all deaf to give us full access. Um, and I think it'll work better for everyone, not just for deaf. Okay. At the moment, the system um, is kind of really confusing um, and I think it needs to be um, a lot clearer um, and to make things a lot clearer for disabled workers. Um, I've got in here um, that, you know, these are the things that I think we need to improve in the future to be able to um, make people, to be able to allow people to be more successful. These are all part of the key that will unlock the door for um, those of us who have those barriers. So I, um, I'm, oh, I'm finished now, thank you very much. Um, oh, just one more little thing actually. Um, before um, there's a working policy of some sort, um, oh yeah, to do with policy. Okay, I think it needs to be improved on a policy level. Um, I think at the moment the policy um, for the act is actually rather weak and I think that um, it needs to be fixed up and improved and to make it clear um, and to make the policy more effective. That will open all the doors and, and remove all the barriers. Yeah, thank you. That is my submission. Thank you, Barry. Um, I have a question and then Anahila has one. In your submission, you wrote about the um, New Zealand Sign Language Act needing to be superseded by this. What is it that's not working in the New Zealand Sign Language Act for you? Can you tell us more about that? Because communication um, with um, hearing people, they don't know sign language. Um, and so that's a barrier for hearing people as well. Um, and so the Sign Language Act, um, it does give some access, um, but really it's not clear about all, um, all the access that's needed. Yeah, so it's a, we need more, um, it needs to be fixed up to allow more, um, we've got to think about how we can um, improve it. You know, it's been a while now and it's we still need to work together more to get make the system of, with the communication more effective for all deaf. Thank you. Thank you, that's, that's great. We'll, we'll go now to Anahila. Thank you, Barry, for your um, presentation. Um, just in terms of your ranking, two out of 10. Could you tell us what the two is, please? Oh, 
I think that um, we can, it, the idea of the issue um, that we're trying to resolve with it is a good one to be looking at. And, um, you know, so it's, a, you know, it is admitting that disabled people and hearing people do need more access. And so that's a good thing. And then, um, oh, I'm trying to, you know, and I know that there's hard work being put into it, um, which is fantastic. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I think that we do need to raise it. Um, to get our 10 out of 10, um, and I'm hoping that that will happen soon. Uh, so yeah, they, and I think the system can improve in, with a law like this. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. We've come uh, to the end of our time now. Um, a really good submission, thank you. Um, and very useful in terms of uh, your visual aids for us as well. I took a photo, so it might end up on my Facebook shortly as well. Uh, but um, thank you for your submission. And I appreciate the effort um, that you've come to. I absolutely recognise how difficult the process has been to organise and communicate in a way uh, that enables you. So thank you um, for your submission. Really appreciate it. And um, we hope to hear from you another time. Thank you. And um, thank you all um, for your time and the hard work that you're putting in. Um, and, and I know that you are working hard to, um, and I know that in the future things will get better for us. So thank you. Thank you. Bye, Barry. Um, so we've got now a, a 10, minute, 10 minute break. Thank you for our uh, interpretation. Um, we now have a 10 minute break. If we can um, perhaps come back at about um, uh, 10.04 so that we're ready to go by 10.05. So we're, um, the meeting is now suspended for 10 minutes. Thank you.
Namihi nui kia koutou, uh, nau mai hare mai anō. Welcome back to the Social Services uh, Select Committee on our final day of submissions from um, on the New Zealand Dis Accessibility Bill. Um, welcome, Gores. Good to have you in the room, uh, the Zoom room. Um, we are now, if we could have the next submitter, Camille Cowley, and um, into the Zoom room, that would be great. Um, Camille, um, tenakwe, um, thank you for um, coming before us today. I love your background. <laughs> um, so I'm Angie, I'm the uh, Chair of the Social Services Select Committee and uh, we have you for 10 minutes uh, today talking with us in regards to your submission. Um, please take it as read and um, if you'd like to uh, leave some time for questions we'd appreciate it as well but this is absolutely your time to tell us um, your views about the Accessibility Bill. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Um, I am tall. Long, uncut, dark blonde hair, uh, dark bruises under the eyes and pain. A male butterfly rash across cheeks, wearing a shirt with recursive grey leaf pattern. A bone brooch of a Maori dolphin, one jade coral necklace and one Celtic knock necklace. And thank you for the time to speak. I was not aware it could be oral through Zoom, so I appreciate this. I have difficulty with writing, so writing was limited. I have been a mechanical engineer working on the manufacture of mobility equipment for disabled people. I have been involved in reviewing civil engineering contracts, a sustainability engineer with manufacturing and waste reduction, a software engineer with experience in web and tech accessibility with the global standards used. I have done housing architecture design reviews for accessibility. I have been a professional support worker for elder care and in my private capacity, a primary carer for my partner who is physically disabled and during many years had a severe brain injury so needed advocacy, help and support. I have neurodevelopmental, sensory and physical disabilities since birth and I have physical, further physical disabilities due to illness which have progressively gotten worse. In my technical career, no company, government department or business ever used or followed accessibility standards already known to exist. For example, more than 98% of websites in New Zealand are inaccessible, more than 90% of government websites. Yet the standards are easy to implement and test. Like with architecture, designers don't want them, don't use them, and have no mandate to. And there's no real enforcement response even when made aware of the inaccessibility. In architecture, this is deadly, and we have to accept that we will likely die in cases of fire or denial of safety due to lack of access. Even ACC often refuses injury cover for people with disabilities, and we are more prone to injuries due to the lack of accessibility in public built environments. Often private insurance companies will deny cover outright, even for things like aircraft or other disasters, because apparently my partner's muscular dystrophy were, would be responsible for a plane or building collapsing. As a severely disabled person, the government still denies food prep support, so under nursing care, you have no cooked food funded. They would have random people of either genders turn up at random times with no notice or identification to immediately shower and start touching your body. These people would have no training in disability conditions or even knowledge of the necessary care risks. Except worse and often frequently, the care would be cancelled or not have staff available without any notice. So no one would show up at all and you are left without, even though you still would be charged for the time. As a disabled woman, I am forced into a relationship to have somewhere to live but I have no income support and no rights to income support, even though at the moment I cannot get a paid employment. So I have no income to pay for my own doctor's bills, transport or specialist appointments needed. So I've had to forgo many of these. I've even had to try minor home surgery for many issues. This is a common experience and puts many disabled people at severe risk of abuse, which increases the harm and negative health effects. Referrals that are urgent have been denied to me due to my disability and there have been severe failings in the health system towards me, from my birth injuries to recent denial of care and equity according to HDC patient rights. There is no real effective avenue for justice or mediation available. I've tried it, it's not accessible. The lack of health care has been deadly for many family and friends. I have been denied public housing support and public housing waitlist access while myself and my disabled partner 
were homeless for years. There's no real response when less than 2% of housing is accessible, and even of the few in the country available, landlords do discriminate against us without any accessible way to remedy this. I spent time sleeping in a car, sleeping in conditions that would flood regularly, and spent time couch surfing. I was even forcibly separated from my partner for over a year as we could not sp find space to couch surf in the same city. My details from government agencies would be sent to completely different addresses, not related to or approved by me, to a different city because they did not view me as an individual with my own address. We have been turned away from restaurants based on how we walk or look. We have been denied access to public council events and parks because my partner needed to use a chair. We have had mobility parking removed in public parks and spaces like council, museums, memorials, and have been denied access to those culturally important spaces. Even places of national importance like Te Papa or the Beehive are not truly accessible. During education in both school and tertiary, I've been denied disability supports necessary. One early school tried to ban my access to the library as they believed without evidence that I could not read and it would be a waste of their time. I have been assaulted by teachers and I've even had teachers advocate anti-vaccination views and promote conspiracy theories that the vaccination would lead to cancer. There have been no accessible ways to adequately mediate to get access to education materials either. Often these would still be denied even after requests through the student services advocate. Also, there was no means to report unethical behavior or even request ethical response from teaching organizations, even when teaching in the fields of health and disability support. I've had constructive dismissal from the denial of accessibility in workspaces, and my partner had his access to workplaces removed through the installation of cycle lane barriers, blocking and removing access to city streets and businesses. Often these cycle barriers have caused severe injuries and high risk. With parking removed and even general parking, we've had access removed to workplaces, medical practices, education, businesses and housing. Frequently work from home concessions available to other employees are denied to disabled people. And this means as well, we have been discounted from employment in the first place. And you may notice common themes that the justice, healthcare, housing, transport, work, income, public spaces and education have been inaccessible. And each time we are forced to fight for any accessibility to be allowed, it creates a deep trauma and denial of mana. We have no real legal rights or a response as no government department has part of a controlling legislation, a mandate to provide accessibility for disabled people. So every fight is often met with no real illegal avenues to pursue and no government department having a legal mandate for accessibility and nothing we could do. There is also a huge problem with infantilization and desexualization of those with a disability. Having a non-disabled parent on a committee is dangerous because of this. A lot of non-disabled parents, even while well-meaning, don't realize they're committing familial abuse when they deny the agency and ability for, of independent choice from their adult or even younger children. They often will use terms and advocate for the continued denial of agency, even though they do not realize the long-standing harm and vulnerability it perpetuates in society, often leading to more financial and physical abuse. We know people with severe neurodevelopmental disorders are still able to have agency in their decisions. However, we rely on groundbreaking disabled people like Sir Robert Martin to prove it to others that we are capable and deserve the same rights to agency and adult experiences. As an engineer, we have enforcement and standards for environmental effects and we have fines for failures. But when it comes to the lives of disabled people, you truly can do anything to us, deny us access, and often we don't have access to justice for adequate response. The Royal Commission on Abuse and Care proves this is a long-standing systemic issue, that the harm is deadly, so deadly that disabled family members and friends younger than me are not here anymore. And you'll never hear their voices. Their mana and spirit has been erased from existence in New Zealand. And this is acceptable to government departments to date. And many more will suffer worse than me and please stop. Each government department needs in its controlling legislation a mandate for accessibility with enforcement actions when it's not met. But effective overarching accessibility legislation is needed too. Because even though the government signed up to the Conventions on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the Paris Agreement to include the UN CRPD as core and climate change goals and policies, literally no government department follows this. 
in justice, court cases have proven the government and crown law can ignore it. I don't foresee myself being able to live much longer with current levels of accessibility. I know this and know it will kill more family and friends and whānau before any government changes are realised. Thank you. It was incredibly powerful, Camille. Thank you um, for your submission. Um, we don't have time for questions, but um, will we be able to have a copy of your notes to be put into the record? Um, are you okay? Yeah. Right now? Uh, it's always a bit um, funny, but I, I'm, yeah, it's not easy when you have to contemplate doing your own home surgery. <laughs> There's Absolutely. a lot of pain and uh, it's tricky because you always toss up um, the risk of severe infection. And that's what I have to contemplate at the moment as well. Um, just because I don't have access to my doctor, I don't have access to the specialists or medical practices to do it. So, Okay, Camille, we're, we're, we're public and live at the moment, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the uh, clerks to give you a call after, um, after this, um, your submission and, um, and, see if, and see how things are for you. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for your submission today extremely powerful and and painful to hear um so thank you for um sharing today thank really you. appreciate it thank you thank you we now have the uh next submitter shannon i think pronounced hennig uh is the uh, surname so if we could have shannon in the room please Hello, Shannon. We can see uh, you have joined us. There you are from your car. As always, <laughs> as always. Um, so, Kira, thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so, we have 10 minutes with you. Please take your submission as being read. Um, if you'd like to leave some time for questions, please do so. Um, thank you. And we're in your hands. Welcome. Um, so, I want to first just the stories that we just heard, um, I hear things like that every day in my professional life. Like it's, it's really across the board. Um, so I'm gonna start my, my submission, actually looking at my written submission, I think it's an inadvertent example of the, well, let's just say the written submission when I looked at it made no sense and I don't know what happened. So I think I had been supporting some people to write their submissions, and I think I copied and pasted from the wrong thing. So when I looked at my written submission that was listed on the parliamentary website, it looked like word salad. And I had this huge internal ableism reaction of, they're gonna think I'm stupid. They're gonna think I can't write. They're gonna think, and I know that's not true, but I think that's just how linked ableism around communication really is. Um, I've submitted before, I have a doctorate, I can write. I know these things, but we have this myth that intelligence and language are the same thing. And I know that's not true because of my family's migrant history. I know what it's like to live in a country where I don't speak the dominant language. I know what it's like to be called uneducated on a bus because I didn't know the right words to say to navigate those spaces. Um, and I have a lot of evidence that that's not the case, that I am intelligent and I'm articulate. But we live in a society where we really, really privilege language, communication, and literacy. And so, you'll be hearing a consensus that this bill is not what we need. What we need is something really enforceable that we can take New Zealand to be fully accessible and in a way that's enforceable and safely um, enforceable. Cause there's still, it's very difficult to put complaints in safely. It's very difficult for people to fight for what they need. Um, and there's a lot of ableism built into many societies. So I'll leave that to other people with lived experience and more policy knowledge than me. I dream of a day that we actually are in line with international conventions we signed up for and that um, we can get on with things and not be fighting for some of the basic accessibility. So today I'm gonna to focus on what's called communication access. Um, and you will have also gotten a submission from the New Zealand Speech Language Therapy Association and I was part of that team writing that one. But this is just me as an individual. 
So communication access impacts every aspect of what we do as a society. So if you think about, say, mental health, you are in a situation where you're not, you might be in a situation where people can't tell whether your language at the moment is a sign that you aren't safe to leave inpatient or is it a sign of a communication disorder. Um, that can get you trapped inpatient for a while if you can't get the right support that has nothing to do with your mental health needs. Or let's say you're so asking for support, but you have to do a choice appointment. This is all about asking questions, answering questions, talk therapy. What if language is hard for you? Can you access these needed services? Think about health. Your doctor talks to you. Do you get a double appointment or do you get a single appointment even though you speak slower and you need more time to process? Do you have to double pay for that? Many people do. Think about justice. Justice is a place where it's all about how well you speak. From the police interviews to standing up in court, those who can tell their story concisely have an advantage. Those who have a language challenge do not. They are at such risk of saying what they think people want to say because there's that double pressure of saying what you feel socially is required, but that might put you in jeopardy as far as justice. Health, I have had con I have supported people in my life where they're asking, can you please feed me? And they get given food, but they can't raise the food to their mouths. And I'd have to go in day after day to feed my friend because their communication system wasn't, way of communicating wasn't acknowledged or understood. So at every single stage of accessing anything, it's hard. And then when you look at things like disability supports, your ability to articulate why something is an actual need will determine sometimes whether that's funded, whether it's reimbursed. And so there's a huge advantage to people who speak and write in a way that's expected. And it's that sweet spot of being able to ask for things in a clear, forceful way, but that's not too forceful or too indirect. The implications for people who are from a culture where you don't ask in those ways, you ask softer or you, ask, you don't beg at all, means some people are getting very different experiences in terms of what they, whether they can access the supports they need. So, and then where I spend most of my days is in education. And it's very clear to me that many people do not have access to what they need so that their communication needs are met in education. Um, do they actually understand what's being said in class? Do they have a means of communication? Do they have access to the supports they need so they can develop these language and literacy skills? We do a really good job if you're right in the middle and you can access that learning at the moment that the whole class is doing it. But if you get out of sync, it can be really, really difficult to the point of traumatizing. So what I'm seeing all the time is complete violations of people's um, ability to access really core parts of our society, parts that they and their family members are paying taxes for, but they don't have access to because of language needs, communication needs. And then there are some people who, who are not going to communicate through language because that's not where their neurological brains allow them to be. And they are equally human and equally valued, but they're not equally valued by society at this point. So I hear heartbreaking and see heartbreaking stories every day. And there's a huge part of it, which is around that communication. So I just think it's also really important when we get to a stage that we have proper legislation that has teeth and is enforceable. It's not just about physical disability. It's not just about sensory disability. People often think of vision and hearing and physical access, which are incredibly essential, absolutely part of the picture, but this invisible thing around um, social communication, language, literacy, um, is really, really important. Um, and then I'm just going to add, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from North America. So I actually was about 12, 13 when the American disability, the ADA went into effect in the United States. And I remember these massive debates around every table. Like, this is going to be so expensive. It's going to put small businesses out. Like it was an uproar at the time. And we moved on and we did it. And not that you want to borrow ideas from America all the time by any means, but the story I had of I could take my boyfriend in a wheelchair to a basketball game, and it was assumed that there would be a spot for us, that there was always a changing room at every stadium. And these are things that I could just ask for and nobody would, I wasn't having to change, do like toilet care on floors. I had the physical access needs were so much better supported 
but we didn't, I didn't see communication access touched on. And so we have an opportunity here to really get this right. Um, and so I just wanted to add my support to all the people who are living it really hard and fighting really, really hard. And many do not feel safe to come forward, do not have the means to come forward, or they might not even have the language skills or communication support to feel comfortable in this space. So I'll leave it at that. So if anyone has any questions, I just wanted to um, add my voice to, to this ongoing battle. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, you know, I, I do think, you know, when it's, it's interesting, you know, when you put in an, um, you know, a submission and all the thoughts that are attached to it, like, honestly, um, what I often tell people in terms of submissions is like, just write one line if you'd rather talk to it. Um, you know, just say, I'd like to submit on this bill and, and it's fine. So uh, certainly from my perspective, there's never any judgment about what um, people put in. Uh, but thank you um, for sharing that any, anyway. Um, so we've got Maureen and then we've got Golras um, to ask some questions. Thanks. Uh, very much uh, for obviously your passion um, in advocating for uh, people for access. Um, the challenge we have in front of us is, is the bill that we have now that we're working on. So in your view, do, it, it, are, are there things that we can add to it without moving outside of the scope of this bill that would um, bring more accessibility into New Zealand? I think I would leave that question to people who have more knowledge around how to write bills that um, the outcome I'm looking for that's in line with the things I see is anything that's done needs to include the communication piece and it needs to be enforceable. And the best, most efficient way forward to get that right, I'll leave that into the hands of people more knowledgeable than me. Understood, thank you. Thank you, uh, Goldriz. Kia ora. thank you for raising communication needs. Um, I, I um, live with multiple sclerosis and I was horrified to find when I was choosing my um, treatment that they, they couldn't even tell me which one was going to slow the communication degeneration because they only measure mobility. Um, but for me, the communication bit was the most important thing. Um, anyway, um, I was also really interested in the comment you made about enforceability needing to um, move beyond the need for people to make individual complaints. I think that's really, really important. And it's it's mm. a really privileged space where people can, um, can make individual complaints to enforce their rights. So I wondered if you wanted to expand on that. But also in my second point, whichever one you want to <laughs> talk to, um, is where would we get, where would you say we would get the standards from um, and would you put the standards into the bill itself around the communication um, access um, or would you would you regulate for that? Just in terms of updating those standards, I think it, I always wonder if legislation is quite a blunt tool. So I would certainly put the need for communication access in the bill but how would we fit those standards and ensure that they're, they're sort of up to date and fit for purpose for the community? All right, so I'll just do that in the same order you went through. Um, you know, as someone, like I know a lot of people with neurological progressive and not progressive disorders. And, and that's what a lot of people say is it's really hard to get the communication side. You know, I don't know you well, but I think communication is probably a core part of your job. And, and I think what's really hard is that's through everything where, um, doctors and medical things, we have that medical model of disability still that really focuses on physical stuff and the communication aspects really, really important. Um, and you see that kind of throughout everything. So I think just the more people with lived experience, the more they can raise that. Um, when it comes to the, I'll jump to the standards. When it comes to the standards, I think those things will evolve. So having some dedicated group that's in charge of updating the standards and so you have legislation that points to that that can lead to that flexibility. Same way we have like broadcast standards, that type of thing, because um, our knowledge changes and it's and we are so far away from that goal that that there's a lot of work. There's a lot of academics and lived experience and mix of those two spaces. 
your academics with lived experience, there's a lot of knowledge out there that could be tapped into. It needs to be properly paid and valued, but there's space for that. As far as complaints, I think this is a really key thing. I have complaint worthy experiences all the time. There is no mechanism for me. If I call it has to be an individual complaint, I have to get, and I don't feel it's safe right now to complain about individual situations. But if I see something five, six, seven, 10, 15 times, I want a mechanism where I can say, I systematically see this and I can't do that. And I have a place of safety as a professional where if I, under the guise of confidentiality and hearing the same story over and over and over again, I want a mechanism where I can point out to the system we're failing and I don't wanna tell people to go. And I think in some cases I have direct experience where it is not safe for people to report these things. Um, even the confidentiality of that chain is not always guaranteed, even though it should be, and they don't have mechanisms for that. And when you're talking about your ability to eat, have housing, access essential medical care, education, um, and we're a small community mm -hmm. and people will retaliate um, if they feel threatened, that's human nature. And there's not a lot of disc protection for that. So. Um, all of that's, I think that's a, a you know, I'm, I was used to different systems and different cultures where I could say, I see a systemic thing. Let's bring it to the right people's attention and get that addressed. And it doesn't have to go all the way up, but there's not a lot of mechanisms for that that's safe. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Shannon. We've, we've come to the end of our time, but um, that's really useful and thoughtful submission. Um, and also thanks for uh, the shout out about um, accessibility legislation being uh, you know catastrophized in America and actually wasn't um, the big drama that people thought it was it just made people's lives better so thank you for that really um, appreciate your time today popping in your car and talking with us thank you so much Go bye for now it. good luck with your work thank you now um, our next submitter Ollie has um, has uh, cancelled. So we're going to move now to the submission from Suzanne Paul. Um, if we could have Suzanne in the room. We can ask uh, Suzanne. Ah, there you are, Suzanne. Thank you. Um, if you can turn on your camera and your sound, that would be great. And um, thanks for being available early as well. Um, good, we can see you there, Suzanne. If you can turn your mute off, that would be great. Um, thanks, oh, there we go. If you could speak, I'm not sure we can hear you. Yes, I'm here. Oh, yes, wonderful, I wonderful. Thank you. Look, Suzanne, we have 10 minutes with you. That's um, fine. Please take your submission as being read. And uh, we're in your hands. If you'd like to leave some time for questions, please do so. Welcome. Um, I'm, I'm nearly 80 years old. I am disabled. I live with um, cancer and other health issues, which do not coincide with my disability, but they are affected by my disability. And I'm also a community advocate, and I have been for about 40 years, and I work with lots and lots of people who have disabilities of one sort or another. And for me, and, and talking about accessibility, and it doesn't just mean recognition of disabilities. It doesn't mean who are affected, age or the cause, a disability is a disability. Accessibility also has to mean provision of services, care and lifestyle support and quality of life, as well as financial costs. Now, I'm going to mention ACC here because this is that I consider this is important as being over 65. People who have disabilities resulting from injury can be on ACC compensation until they're 65. The minute they turn 65, they, they generally are then required to be on New Zealand Super. And that is frequently half the rate of income that they would have been receiving on ACC. And it does not match their actual costs of living, their medical costs and other uh, outgoings. Um, even though a disability allowance is provided and there are other means of getting assistance, 
frequently over 65s do not have enough funding to actually live and have a quality of life. There are some things that I'm going to mention, and I'm sorry about this, but for example, a person who is over 65 who is disabled and goes into care, they receive a weekly amount of $49.33. And that money has to cover things like all their personal issues, their toiletries. Um, in some cases, it's toilet paper, um, continence pads, all of that. And, and those things really should be provided under the financial program that's set up for people in care. People under 65 who also go into care have the same issues. So it's yeah. with one, the care can be provided and covered by ACC, but for the other, it's not. They come under the MSD superannuation costs. Um, um, the, these are things that need to be addressed because the finances for a person with a disability are frequently much higher than those for an able-bodied person. Sorry, I'm, <clears throat> I have a little problem talking at times. You're doing fine. So if you Thank need you. a glass of water or something, by all means. Um, no, I just, I just had, and no, it's just that I, I get a muscle spasm in my throat. Um, the, the next issue that I want to address is in home care. Now, in home care is provided for people who live at home, and it's also covered under most circumstances by um, the the government uh, funding program. The problem is that a lot of people who are at home with a disability are quite isolated. Many of them, like myself, have no family. Frequently, the only person that they may see will be their support worker who may come once a week for one or two hours. If a person is restricted to being at home without social contact, then that isolation can affect their mental health, which will then affect their emotional and physical health. We have an issue where people have a disability, a support animal, and, and, and those animals are covered um, financially. But if a person is at home alone with nobody, they may have a cat or a dog as a companion animal. That companion animal is not qualified under the same uh, regulations as what an, um, an accessibility dog is. And these are, these are also important things because, again, a person who lives at home and is isolated with a disability, regardless of what that disability is, can actually be affected health-wise. When we can also come down to transport for people with a disability, and I'm going to use my case here, I have an artificial elbow in, in my left arm, and I've been recommended not to use public transport because I cannot put a great deal of weight on it. And if I was to swing on this arm, I could probably damage it permanently. So unlike a lot of people, I actually still drive and I have a car, but there are a lot of people for whom transport is an issue because of their income, because they're not able to use public transport. So you get half price taxis and you get parking uh, mobility um, um, hangers. Um, but it still doesn't cover the extra costs of a person who needs to use a taxi, you know, to get around, um, to do their shopping because their support worker is not allowed um, to take them shopping anymore, to do their shopping, which used to be what happened. We can do click and collect, yes, yeah, sure, and we can do delivery. But that still doesn't mean we have the social contact that is required for a healthy living style for a person with a disability. Um, my next question is, you know, where the finance comes from. People with a disability get assistance from MSD under a disability allowance, but the disability allowance does not cover everything. It is a, it is a cap. 
you can get in temporary additional support extra, but there's also a cap on that. And frequently those amounts do not, again, cover the actual living cost of a person with a disability. My last thought, and this is something I really believe in, is that ACC and the health system actually run together. They cover similar things, but they are not connected and they don't actually handhold very well. So if we were to have a, an ACC and a health system combined, we would have better coverage of both people with disabilities from injury and people with disabilities from health issues. It, it, to me, it makes sense because we would not have this disconnect for the two separate issues because people with disabilities get ill and people who are ill have disabilities. So they actually run basically side by side. Um, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, a really good submission. And um, I liked the, uh, the the fact that you focus on you focused on um, transport and um, sorry on accommodation in your submission, but um, spoke to a much broader sense of um, issues. I um, and the forty nine dollars that you talk about is people being um, when people are in. Um, in care that's that's yeah. a really interesting issue to um have brought before us as well so thank you for that um do we have any questions from the team look doesn't appear so we've um we actually only have uh, we're only two minutes under anyway uh look thanks thanks for coming and submitting um for us really appreciate um your written and your um oral submission today so thank you and thanks. perhaps we'll see you again Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Keep safe. So we now come to the last submission um, for the hearing on the hearings on this uh, bill. Um, People's first, and it's the local Ashburton group. Now you may recall that we had um, this local group last time, and we had some real difficulties with connectivity. So I'm. Um, really hopeful Ooh, we've got eat cake nutrition sounds like a great group um, so I'm really hopeful that we have connectivity this time and we can hear from um, the members from People First in Ashburton so oh damn eat, eat cake is gone and People First are back so um, namahi nui kia korua welcome to oh kia koutou the three of you, welcome again. Looks like we have you in the room a lot in a lot more stable network than we had last time. Thank goodness. Um, thank you for your submission and for uh, you all coming in to talk to us again. Really appreciate you hanging in there and um, and making the effort this time. You're our last submitters for the whole bill, um, so you get um, you get to. Uh, have the final final say on this bill. So uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks so much. Uh, Namihi nui kia koutou. Welcome. We have you for 15 minutes. Thanks. I'm Desiree uh, Tebe Bakafi. Um, we've also got my husband, Tonga Bakafi, and my brother-in-law, which is Peter Chester. Um, my brother, Peter Chester. I was meant to say you. You can hear us all right? Yeah, if you could speak up a bit, that'll be helpful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we can hear you well and we can see you well, which is mm -hmm. the main problem last time, eh? So thanks. Yeah. Yeah, no, um... Our issue is that um, we need educational um, communication for education for the deaf, blind, and the speech impaired. No, like if we had courses, there was something like that to help. Um, because there's times where, uh, for example, my my husband hears deaf in one ear, and some people don't talk at him, or they 
who from the wrong side to them. And um, people just get creepy at them because they think it's not their smell and stuff like that. So they start sending them to repeat on their bike. So, yeah, and for the blind and that, and that's just to, so that people are aware of the different um, communication issues that there are, that there needs to be education on for like a braille for us to do in braille for to help the ones that are blind and sign language for the ones that are deaf. And for people to look at it um, and slow down with their talking when it comes to the speech and hear people and give them a chance to be able to speak without having to be interrupted all the time. And so that they feel valued and that they don't feel unvalued. The transportation, yes, we have no bus, but we have taxi. Well, with, with myself, I, I use a, what do you call it, a disability card mobility. for power, a mobility, mobility. A mobility card, which is which is real good for, for myself and, and, and my wife. I've got one as well. And, and so, yep, it is reasonable, but we don't know when it's going to go up in us. They fluctuate with different drivers on how much you pay. And we've been told by the boss himself that it should be the same night and day time. But some of them don't listen. Thank you. Um. Uh, yeah, a lot of public buildings do not have public have access for the for people in wheelchairs and walkers. The floor layout. Yeah, the floor layout is not appropriate. Appropriate, like um, I, there's a couple of stores I can name, but I won't. But you can't even get into them. What Peter's trying to say is when it comes to the door, like when you're going into a shop, they haven't got the aisles or where people in wheelchairs or walkers can get around um, safely without banging into things. Even people that's got a, um, the blind cane can't get around the shops very well. Um, they have it really cluttered up um, and the entryways are quite narrow. They need to, when they do the floor layout or, or new buildings and that they need to be aware of people with wheelchairs. Even if they have a plan, get someone them that's in the wheelchair to do a test to make sure that it is safe for them. Even the ones that have the big bags on the back of the the mobility scooters. Yeah, and, and that that's another problem. Where you go and turn and you might smack into a project and then they get angry and tell you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Got no room to turn around. Mm -hmm. So I ha I have a question um about uh about the taxis. Um so you know when you 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 get told that you've got it should be one price and it's always one price day or night. Yeah. What um, when it's not? Where do you ha where do you go to complain about that, or do you just have to put up with it? Well, we, we have complained to the boss of the company. Yeah. Um, but he, but even he turns it just depends on the driver at that time, and like we could go from our place to a friend's place, and one person charges two dollars. Another person charged two fifty. Another person charged three dollars, and mm. it's like it should be one for that same distance. It should be one fee, one fee only, not a fluctuating. Yeah, some I know. people don't have all that that type of money. They may only have the two dollars because that's what they got charged one time, and then yeah. they can charge something different, and that could be only like two hours later. And and so, so where do you go to complain? 
Do you have somewhere to complain or do you just have to we put just up ring with the, it? We just ring the taxi number and um, we, we ask for the boss, um, and his name's Graham, and we just tell him and the, but yeah. He's left in his hand. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and with the Ashburn, there is only one taxi company. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. And you don't have buses either, do you? No. Right. Yeah. So that's one of the issues too, isn't it? Is um, smaller, more rural towns don't necessarily have uh, public transport to support you. Mm. So you've got one choice, and that's to take a taxi if you can't drive. Yeah. 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 They do. They do. Have, they do have a metro. They do have a bus that that you only get two hours to do everything. You have to right. rush in that two hours. They've only just started. Mostly for the ones that can't get to town, that don't have work. Right. Mainly okay. for the existing um, grocery shopping or for medical. Yeah. And that's it. All in that two hours. Yeah, that's that's quick, isn't it? So yeah. um, do you have any more that I, I interrupted? I'm sorry. Do you have any more that you wanted to say uh, before we go to other questions from um, um, our, our committee? Yes, um, I had on the transportation, um, with what my husband was saying about transportation, um, some of the like of the trains, vans and all that, they don't all have um, a low floor for when people like in wheelchairs or there's like walkers or even um, mothers or friends are having trouble getting onto the buses and that and that's not just here in Ashburnham but it's in mm -hmm. everywhere um mentioned oh, yeah. mm -hmm. we have like people are having to send on buses and like the, the pregnant woman, and that she's having to stand, which is not right, um, they need to have something that's a lot more um, mm -hmm. convenient for a lot of the ones that's um, e.g. pregnant or they've all got um, wheelchairs, walkers, mothers with friends, and. Um, no, so the problem is yeah. walking. Because they can't, they, they um, can't put friends as much on the bus. Uh, as well as elderly that can't lift their legs high enough to climb onto the bus, they need to have the have appropriate um, names so that everyone can have that same access to all transportations. Oh, as for I was talking about those, I was talking about armour areas buildings. I'm talking not just talking about you, I'm talking about assisted buildings too. Referring to Paper Plus, not Paper Plus. What's that store in town? Hello, Bananas. You can't even walk around there. You can. You can, you can but mobility and quality is hard to, to move And walking can't get, even get through there. So, so that means that you can't shop there, which means that your 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 money isn't being you spent there. there. You have to go somewhere else. So they're missing out on customers. Yeah, there's people yeah. in wheelchairs that can't get around mainly in that particular shop, and if they ask for someone to help them. Like they could be in the supermarket, and there's stuff that's up on the top shelf, and they ask for help. Sometimes they get quite rudely spoken to. I had that exam um, happen to me one time when I was in the wheelchair three and a half years ago. And uh, I asked for help and they turned and basically just shrugged their shoulder and walked away and basically made me defend my, for myself when I was stuck in the wheelchair at the time and couldn't stand. So for lots of those, they need to have a lot more people that's willing to help, especially in their service, place of service. So do you think it would be helpful to have somewhere where you can record um, and talk about um, 
the barriers that you face is would it be useful to have a, a what we call a barriers register a lot of other submitters have have said it's a good place to start so we can start recording the problems that people yeah. have um yeah. you think i agree yep yeah, good okay oh, do you, um are you ready to go to a question from maureen yes yeah. okay maureen thank you Madam Chair, um, and thank you team for your persistence in coming back to the committee. Um, the technology supported you well today, so that's great. Um, you've mentioned um, some, um, what I assume would be regulation, uh, design standards, building regulation around um, accessibility. So for instance, getting on and off the buses in and out of shops, and then getting around inside the shops, you know, the aisle width. And we've heard that from other people. Would you suggest that that would be a good addition to this bill? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I do. They are for that. So um, I just want to be clear that you're suggesting to us that uh, things like those regulations or design standards are actually uh, considered and how we can uh, make sure that they're enforced going forward. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Good idea. Now, I don't see any further um, questions from um, our committee. So um, I just want to thank you for, um, as Maureen said, hanging in there and coming back in and talking yeah. to us. Because, um, yeah, you really did have a bad connection last time. Um, yeah. Whereas this time it's been awesome. So, hey, thank you so much for um, um, being our. Can I one more thing to a place? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, one, when I was working, I like to see more employers trained up to deal deal with people with disability, so they can get more help. So, when you say um, trained up, so they can get more help, do you mean um, employers get more help, or so that the employee gets more help? Um, both. Oh, okay. Yeah. And there's more opportunities out there for people. Because I, when I was working, I always got picked on. Yep. I put a stop to it in the end because I was, I learned I could talk to management. Yeah. Only good. because I learned that I was safe. Yep. But I still think there should be education there for them. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, universal point, actually, a point that everyone uh, should continue to learn um, in this space because none of us understand everything. We all have our different experiences and the more we understand, the better it is for everyone, I think. But yeah, your point about employment because we know that there are lots of people um, seeking um, employees out there who are who are struggling to employ people because they can't find people, um, and you know there are twenty four percent of the um, of our population have a noted disability or dis describe themselves as having a disability, so that's a big proportion of our employed community well, as well. Me, I was I was made redundant, and I and I'm stopped looking for a job because I'm not confident. <laughs> In looking for another, finding another job to the way happen. Yeah. And I think that that's... My age that, and my, dis, my age, a disability, two counts against me. Yeah. And that's really sad because I'm sure you've got lots to offer. Yeah. Um, and look, we're at, we're at end of time now um, in terms of our submissions, but I want to thank you for being our last submitters come, um, come today and across all the months that we've been hearing from people. It's, it's yeah. been awesome to have you. Uh, thanks um, for your time. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. I hope it's nice down in Ashburton. And um, we will um, hopefully hear from you on another submission another time. So thanks so much. Kaki dear. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.